everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. Just as an aside before we start, did anyone notice the name of this building as you came in? McPherson. McPherson building, yeah. It's named after my brother-in-law's father, who was a professor of engineering here. It's the first time I've been in it, so I didn't notice when I came in. Ah, that's Reg's building. Um, okay, just a caveat to frame this talk for this audience. I know that a lot of people who are members of the ATA are already very technically minded. So um, I don't want to insult your intelligence by suggesting you don't know all this stuff already. So in a sense, take this talk as a bit of a, and a interpret this as a, and I, some ideas around how to reframe the discussion about home energy efficiency for the benefit of those who might not know as much as you do. And on we go. So, Bizzetti coined this idea of energy freedom um, to try and empower householders to radically reduce their home energy consumption. Um, and as Rob alluded, the energy freedom campaign or project is a spin-off from Bizzetti's Zero Carbon Australia Buildings Plan, which was released a few years back. Uh, I was one of the lead authors, Rob helped, Tim Forsey is here, also was a major contributor. Uh, anyone else worked on it? Um, really? No? Good? Um, okay. A big part of the, the mindset around this is, is challenging what I would view as sort of a, the status quo as it stands with respect to home energy. Um, so, Normal says, I can't do much about my home energy consumption. Um, my energy bills are largely outside my control. Energy is something I buy from the big company. I don't really care where my energy comes from. I'll wait until I renovate to fix problem X. Um, of course I use gas. Um, these are the sorts of thinking that we're trying to challenge in this um, campaign, this book, this talk. Um, and to try and encapsulate the idea of energy freedom into one, uh, one single idea, the, the essence of it, the core of it, it's the idea of getting to net zero energy without using fossil fuels. Uh, there's a whole bunch of technologies like heat pumps and stuff behind that, but I think that frame, that phrase, net zero energy, no fossil fuels, sort of encapsulates uh, what we're trying to convey. So let's pick that apart, net zero energy. Um, that's when you get uh, annual energy consumption equaling your annual energy generation. And thinking about net energy till, uh, up until the advent of PV would have been meaningless because homes were just always consumers of energy. But with the advent of PV, uh, it's a game changer. So instead of just thinking about the energy you consume, you've got a balance. You've got energy consumption, you've got energy generation, and looking at that balance is, 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 is a key. Um, the second side of that um, statement about what energy freedom is pertains to fossil fuels. So substantially what we're talking about there is homes getting off gas, because um, that's the main fuel that homes are the direct consumer of. We're not talking about indirect uh, consumption through um, grid energy and, and embodied energy and all that. So um, substantially there's, a, there's a, an enduring myth around so-called natural gas that it's a clean uh, and cheap fuel. Um, we're of the view that it's actually an inefficient fuel, uh, that when you look at the end-to-end -end emissions of the use of gas, that the emissions are actually very high, that the, they're not really any less than coal-fired electricity and the price is increasing because of factors that are beyond the scope of this talk. Um, another key aspect of the whole campaign is to encourage people to look at measures to improve their home in terms of its energy use as a, as a real and tangible investment. Um, so, um, and, and as a result of that investment, comfort goes up, operating costs go down, 
house value goes up and emissions go down. So by framing this as an investment, not as a cost, hopefully we can overcome people's um, objections to spending money on things like energy efficiency. Um, you know, people are quite comfortable generally looking at superannuation or property or shares as an investment, but I think in a very real sense, money spent on improving your home can be at least as good an investment as money invested in those other things. Um, so, again, for context, we're, we're the Energy Freedom Campaign, we're targeting people that do have the, the potential to improve their homes. So, this is not targeted at businesses, it's not targeted at tenants, it's homeowners. Okay, basic principles, how to, how to get there. Uh, energy efficiency plus renewable energy, uh, no fossil fuel. And we've sort of, for the sake of making an easy rubric around energy freedom, we've broken it up into nine steps. Um, insulation, windows, lighting, dry proofing hot water, monitoring and control, heating and cooling, cooking and appliances, and lastly solar power. So eight of those nine relate to reducing your demand, and the last one, of course, is generating your own energy. Uh, caveat around doing it yourself, um, pipes and wires, use the pros, get professional advice. Okay, um, so let's run through those nine steps. Uh, lighting. Um, many of you are already familiar with the, uh, the great drives in energy efficiency that go with light emitting diode technology. Uh, much, much better than uh, incandescent technology, better than fluorescent. Um, so our advice is to, uh, where you've got incandescent lights, replace those lights even before they fail because payoffs are worth it. Where you've got existing fluorescents, um, perhaps wait until they fail because the, the relative merits of LEDs over fluoros isn't as great. Um, Downlights, don't just replace the bulb. Downlights are a, a whole a whole host of problems with downlights. Through, through. Uh, th this discussion around lighting is, uh, in, the, in the first order, a, 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 a lighting efficiency question. But when it pertains to downlights, downlights are a problem not just because of the lighting efficiency, they're a problem because they uh, lead to uh, compromise of the insulation in the ceiling and they also lead to, to drafts. So downlights are, are the intersection of three different sets of energy efficiency problems. Um, and it's, even though lighting, the amount of energy that most homes use for, for lighting is, is it, it's not the biggest contributor. But so why have we put this number one? It's because downlights are really common and downlights uh, have, downlights touch on lighting efficiency, they touch on insulation and they touch on draft proofing. So that's why we put lighting number one. So don't just replace the bulb when you're dealing with downlights. You need to replace the entire light fitting with a sealed one so you can insulate over it and stop the drafts associated with ventilated downlight fittings. Okay, step two, draft proofing. You know, in a sense, draft proofing is the low hanging fruit, but it's, it's not a sexy topic. Um, but it's a surprisingly important one. Often, I view it as the low hanging fruit of, of energy efficiency because there are so many opportunities in most homes to lower the energy consumption by just plugging a few gaps and doing simple things. Uh, and there's often lots of little things that together combine to make a big difference. Um, I, I work, my, my day job is as a home energy assessor um, and I've been doing that professionally for about a year and in that time I've seen about a hundred, over a hundred homes and uh, I'm surprised at how many, how often uh, I see the basic sealing of external doors 
is not done right. Um, just to give you an example, I noticed when I was sitting there a moment ago that um, see up here these vents and just above and below them, you see these little dust trails. But those dust trails are characteristic of drafts that you often see uh, around the front door. So when you get home, have a look at your external doors in, in the door jam groove. I guarantee that a lot of you will see little dust trails like that. They're a sure telltale sign of drought. So um, that, that's just one little thing. Uh, that, uh, there's lots of drafts out there and it's low hanging fruit. Exhaust fans and another big uh, cause of draft. Um, they're, they're not a great, uh, your typical exhaust fan amounts to just a big hole in the ceiling. Um, uh, vents, flues and chimneys, if you've got um, lots of homes, well, most homes up, built up until about 20 years ago were built with wall vents that are really redundant in most cases unless you've got fire in the room. Um, chimneys are often un I don't have a damper on them, so they're a big constant source of drought. And ventilated down like I've already mentioned. Um, <clears throat> moving on, third step is insulation. Uh, this is the most obvious and, and elementary part of the discussion about uh, uh, home energy efficiency. Um, but some things that go beyond what you might already know about insulation. Um, all right give you the idea that what you might see as a common guidelines or, or recommendations around insulation, think of these as minimum recommendations. Um, when, when people say we need R4 in the ceiling or something, that's a minimum recommendation. Uh, so don't be afraid to go beyond the minimum. Um, when it comes to uh, home efficiency ratings, you're all familiar with the, the star rating system as it applies to homes in Australia. And you'll, you'll be aware that six star homes are required um, for new homes and significant renovations have to achieve six star efficiency. But that's not an exemplar of great efficiency. Six stars is the, is the worst performing home you can legally build in this country. So that's that's a, a way of reframing what six stars means. It's not the, uh, a, a great example. It, it, it's the worst you can build. Don't be afraid to go beyond it. So um, consider exceeding the, the minimum guidelines in terms of uh, the amount of insulation you might put in your ceiling, for example, by uh, one and a half times or even twice. Um, for example, I'd encourage you to try and get your roof structure to an insulation level of about R6. Lots of homes are usually less than half that. Um, in, of the hundred or so homes I've been in the roof of in the last year or so, um, I think I've seen one or maybe two that are more than uh, R3. Um, and most of them are less than R2. So, Lots of people have a mindset that, oh yeah, yeah, my house is insulated, my roof is insulated. But it's not a binary thing, it's not insulated or not. And you'd be surprised at how um, poor homes can be even though they are insulated. Yeah? What would you describe R3 as? Would you get fiberglass or one of those type of insulation packs? How big, how thick um, is R3? Uh, R3 is about 150 mil. Is it? So R6 would be twice that, would it? Yeah. Depending on the material. Um, floors, for example, most, uh, unless you're dealing with, unless you're talking about slabs, uh, a, a suspended timber floor is about R0.7. Um, you put some insulation under that, it'll make a huge difference to the performance of the house. Very often, floors are the weakest link in terms of the, the heat loss pathways in a house. So often when a house has a moderate level of ceiling insulation, it's no longer the weak link. You know, the walls or the windows or the floors are going to move the weak link. The next step, windows. Um, per unit of 
of the area, windows are always the weakest link, short of having an open door or a hole in the, a hole in the wall. Um, there's often a tendency to make them bigger than they should be because they are a weak link thermally. Um, double glazing or secondary glazing um, is something that most people will be familiar with as a way of making uh, windows more thermally efficient. Um, curtains and blinds can help a lot as well. External shading can help the heat flow through, through windows. But uh, I just make the point that there is a bit of a myth around double glazing that a double glazed window is a good insulator. It's not. Double, a single glazed window is a terrible insulator. A double glazed window is merely a bad insulator. So you're just going from terrible to bad. That's not to say that you shouldn't do it. It's a, think of it as a necessary but not sufficient thing to do to make your house uh, efficient. But, but when you uh, think of a, of, a, of a double glazed window as a bad insulator, it, it, it'll help you. Uh, once you have that mindset, then you know, you'll be less inclined to, to have windows that are bigger than they should be. Because <coughs> often, often double glazing becomes a, a way of allowing people to have windows that are really bigger than they, they should be. If double glazing is just better than single glazing, what's optimal glazing? Well, there's no short answer to that. Um, I encourage double glazing, but it's just by itself it's not enough. Um, yeah. So where's triple glazing on that? Is it marketing stuff or is it actually do something? No. Okay, going from single to double glazing um, halves the heat flow. Um, uh, so it's a ratio of two to one. Uh, going from uh, double uh, to triple glazing uh, is a ratio of uh, two to three. So, so uh, you get two thirds of the heat flow through a triple glazing window as you would through a double glazing window. So it's the ratio of the number of, of surfaces. Where do they stick on films? Films fit in that uh, little gradient. No, no, that no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stick on. Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> we're trying to touch over the, a, a, a lot of stuff here. Why don't we save some of this detail till till the end if we've got time? Otherwise, we'll, we'll get bogged down in, in individual categories. Um, so uh, let's come back to that if we have time. So step five, appliances and cooking. Um, so you might have redundant devices or things that, um, if, if the device is not redundant, they might be on more than they need to be. Um, I'll give you an example. If you've got an electric cooktop, um, these days it's a requirement that near the cooktop there has to be a switch uh, so that the cooktop can be isolated electric cooktops are supposed to be on their own circuit and it, there's a switch in the kitchen near the cooktop. Um, electric cooktops have a standby power consumption so often people just think of that switch as sort of an emergency you know, if you have to turn it off in an emergency but don't treat it like that, treat it as you know, turn it off when at the switch on the wall when you're not using it so that the standby power associated with, the, with that cooktop is no longer drawn. Um, Little things like that, they all add up. Same for reduction? Yeah, definitely. Um, consider efficiency when buying appliances. Um, a lot of classes of appliance have a star rating system associated with them. Um, yeah. <coughs> I'm a big fan of induction electric cooktops. Aside from being very efficient, they provide uh, a great way of moving away from gas cooktops, which are otherwise kind of the dominant way that people tend to cook uh, these days. Uh, heating and cooling. Um, I would say as a general rule, avoid ducted systems. Um, there's a whole raft of problems associated with ducting, cover and depth in the book. Um, heat pumps are a key technology, not just for heating and cooling, but for hot water as well. Um, in a very real sense, heat pumps as a technology 
allow the harvesting of ambient renewable heat. So a lot of people don't realise that they really are a, a renewable energy technology and that the heat energy in the air around our homes can be harvested uh, in a very real sense. So they are a renewable energy technology. They've come a long way in the last 20 years. They're a lot more efficient and quieter and more reliable than they used to be. And uh, some of them have some really cool additional features, which uh, perhaps the topic of another discussion. Um, broadly, get rid of gas heating. Good heat pump. Hi everybody, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. Just as an aside before we start, did anyone notice the name of this building as you came in? McPherson. McPherson. McPherson building, yeah. It's named after my brother in law's father, who's a professor of engineering here. It's the first time I've been in it. So I didn't notice when I came in. Ah, that's Reg's building. Mm -hmm. um, okay, just a, a caveat to frame this talk for this audience. I know that a lot of people who are members of the ATA are already very technically minded. So um, I don't want to insult your intelligence by suggesting you don't know all this stuff already. So in a sense, take this talk as a bit of a interpret this as a, I, some ideas around how to reframe the discussion about home energy efficiency for the benefit of those who might not know as much as you do. And on we go. So, Bizzetti coined this idea of energy freedom um, to try and empower householders to radically reduce their home energy consumption. Um, and as Rob alluded, the Energy Freedom Campaign or project is a spin-off from BZE's Zero Carbon Australia Buildings Plan, which was released a few years back. Uh, I was one of the lead authors, Rob helped, Tim Forsey is here, also was a major contributor. Uh, anyone else work on it? Um, the meeting? No? Good. Um, okay. A big part of the the mindset around this is, is challenging what I would view as sort of the status quo as it stands with respect to home energy. Um, so Normal says, I can't do much about my home energy consumption. Um, my energy bills are largely outside my control. Energy is something I buy from a big company. I don't really care where my energy comes from. I'll wait until I renovate to fix problem X. Um, of course I use gas. Um, these are the sorts of thinking that we're trying to challenge in this um, campaign, this book, this talk. Um, and to try and encapsulate the idea of energy freedom into one, uh, I, one single idea, the, the essence of it, the core of it, it, it's the idea of getting to net zero energy without using fossil fuels. Uh, there's a whole bunch of technologies like heat pumps and stuff behind that. But I think that frame, that phrase, net zero energy, no fossil fuels, sort of encapsulates um, what we're trying to convey. So let's pick that apart. Net zero energy, um, that's when you get uh, annual energy consumption equaling your annual energy generation. And thinking about net energy till, uh, up until the advent of PV would have been meaningless because homes were just always consumers of energy. But with the advent of PV, uh, it's a game changer. So instead of just thinking about the energy you consume, you've got a balance. You've got energy consumption, you've got energy generation, and looking at that balance is, 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 is a key. Um, the second side of that um, statement about what energy freedom is pertains to fossil fuels. So substantially, what we're talking about there is homes getting off gas, um, because that's the main fuel that homes are the direct consumer of. We're not talking about indirect uh, consumption through uh, grid energy and, and embodied energy and all that. So um, substantially, there's a there's a, an enduring myth around so-called natural gas that it's a clean uh, and cheap fuel. Um, 
we're of the view that it's actually an inefficient fuel, uh, that when you look at the end-to-end -end emissions of the use of gas, that the emissions are actually very high, that they're not really any less than coal-fired electricity. And the price is increasing because of factors that are beyond the scope of this talk. Um, another key aspect of the whole campaign is to encourage people to look at measures to improve their home in terms of its energy use as a, as a real and intangible investment. Um, so, um, and, and as a result of that investment, comfort goes up, operating costs go down, house value goes up, and emissions go down. So by framing this as an investment, not as a cost, hopefully we can overcome people's um, objections to spending money on things like energy efficiency. Um, you know, people are quite comfortable generally in looking at superannuation or property or shares as an investment, but I think in a very real sense, money spent on improving your home can be at least as good an investment as money invested in those other things. Um, so, again, for context, we're, we're the Energy Freedom Campaign, we're targeting people that do have the, the potential to improve their homes. So, this is not targeted at businesses, it's not targeted at tenants, it's homeowners. Okay, basic principles, how to, how to get there. Uh, energy efficiency plus renewable energy, uh, no fossil fuel. And we've sort of, for the sake of making an easy rubric around energy freedom, we've broken it up into nine steps. Um, insulation, windows, lighting, dry proofing, hot water, monitoring and control, heating and cooling, cooking and appliances, and lastly, solar power. So eight of those nine relate to reducing your demand, and the last one, of course, is generating your own energy. Uh, caveat around doing it yourself, um, pipes and wires, use the pros, get professional advice. Okay, um, so let's run through those nine steps. Uh, lighting. Um, many of you are already familiar with the, uh, the great drives in energy efficiency that go with light emitting diode technology. Uh, much, much better than uh, incandescent technology, better than fluorescent. Um, so our advice is to, uh, where you've got incandescent lights, replace those lights even before they fail because the payoffs are worth it. Where you've got existing fluorescents, um, perhaps wait until they fail because the, the relative merits of LEDs over fluoros isn't as great. Um, downlights, don't just replace the bulb. Downlights are a, a whole a whole host of problems with downlights. Through, through. Uh, th this discussion around lighting is, uh, in, the, in the first order, a, 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 a lighting efficiency question. But when it pertains to downlights, downlights are a problem not just because of the lighting efficiency, they're a problem because they uh, lead to uh, compromise of the insulation in the ceiling and they also lead to, to drafts. So downlights are, are the intersection of three different sets of energy efficiency problems. Um, and it's, even though lighting, the amount of energy that most homes use for, for lighting is is, it's not the biggest contributor. But so why have we put this number one? It's because downlights are really common and downlights uh, have, downlights touch on lighting efficiency, they touch on insulation and they touch on draft proofing. So that's why we put lighting number one. So don't just replace the bulb. When you're dealing with downlights, you need to replace the entire light fitting with a sealed one so you can insulate over it and stop the drafts associated with ventilated downlight fittings. Okay, step two, draft proofing. Uh, in a sense, draft proofing is the low hanging fruit, but it's, it's not a sexy topic. Um, 
but it's a surprisingly important one. Often, I view it as the low-hanging fruit of, of energy efficiency because there are so many opportunities in most homes to lower the energy consumption by just plugging a few gaps and doing simple things. Uh, and there's often lots of little things that together combine to make a big difference. Um, I, I work, my, my day job is as a home energy assessor um, and I've been doing that professionally for about a year and in that time I've seen about a hundred, over a hundred homes and uh, I'm surprised at how many, how often uh, I see that basic sealing of external doors is not done right. Um, just to give you an example, I noticed when I was sitting there a moment ago that um, see up here these vents and just above and below them, you see these little dust trails. But those dust trails are characteristic of drafts that you often see uh, around the front door. So when you get home, have a look at your external doors in, in the door jam groove. I guarantee that a lot of you will see little dust trails like that. They're a sure telltale sign of drought, so um, that, that's just one little thing. That, uh, there's lots of drafts out there and it's low hanging fruit. Exhaust fans and another big uh, cause of draft. Um, they're, they're not a great, uh, your typical exhaust fan amounts to just a big hole in the ceiling. Um, uh, vents, flues and chimneys, if you've got um, lots of homes most homes up, built up until about 20 years ago were built with wall vents that are really redundant in most cases unless you've got a fire in the room. Um, chimneys are often, um, don't have a damper on them, so they're a big constant source of drought. And ventilated down like I've already mentioned. Um, <clears throat> moving on, the third step is insulation. Uh, this is the most obvious and, and elementary part of the discussion about insulation. Uh, home energy efficiency. Um, but some things that go beyond what you might already know about insulation, um, I want to give you the idea that what you might see as the common guidelines or, or recommendations around insulation, think of these as minimum recommendations. Um, when, when people say we need R4 in the ceiling or something, that's a minimum recommendation. Uh, so don't be afraid to go beyond the minimum. Um, when it comes to uh, home efficiency ratings, you're all familiar with the, the star rating system as it applies to homes in Australia. And you'll, you'll be aware that six star homes are required um, for new homes and significant renovations have to achieve six star efficiency. But that's not an exemplar of great efficiency. Six stars is the, is the worst performing home you can legally build in this country. So that's, that's a, a way of reframing what six stars means. It's not the, a, a great example. It, it's the worst you can build. Don't be afraid to go beyond it. So um, consider exceeding the, the minimum guidelines in terms of the amount of insulation you might put in your ceiling, for example, by you know, one and a half times or even twice. Um, for example, I'd encourage you to try and get your roof structure to an insulation level of about R6. Lots of homes are usually less than half that. Um, in, of the hundred or so homes I've been in the roof of in the last year or so, um, I think I've seen one or maybe two that are more than R3. Um, and most of them are less than R2. So lots of people have the mindset that, oh yeah, yeah, my house is insulated, my mm -hmm. roof is insulated. But it's not a binary thing, it's not insulated or not. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised at how um, poor homes can be even though they are insulated. Yeah. What would you describe R3 as? Would you get fiberglass or one of those types of insulation mats? How big, how thick um, is R3? Uh, R3 is about 
150 mil? Is it? So R6 would be twice that, would it? Yeah. Depending on the material. Um, floors, for example, most, uh, unless you're dealing with, unless you're talking about slabs, uh, a suspended timber floor is about R0.7. Um, you put some insulation under that, it'll make a huge difference to the performance of the house. Very often, floors are the weakest link in terms of the, the heat loss pathways in a house. So often, when a house has a moderate level of ceiling insulation, it's no longer the weak link. You know, the walls or the windows or the floors are going to move the weak link. The next step, windows. Um, per unit of, of area, windows are always the weakest link, short of having an open door or a hole in the, a hole in the wall. Um, there's often a tendency to make them bigger than they should be because they are a weak link thermally. Um, double glazing or secondary glazing um, is something that most people will be familiar with as a way of making uh, windows more thermally efficient. Um, curtains and blinds can help a lot as well. External shading can help the heat flow through, through windows. But uh, I just make the point that there is a bit of a myth around double glazing that a double glazed window is a good insulator. It's not. Double, uh, a single glazed window is a terrible insulator. A double glazed window is merely a bad insulator. So you're just going from terrible to bad. <laughs> That's not to say that you shouldn't do it. It's a, Think of it as a necessary but not sufficient thing to do to make your house uh, efficient. But, but when you uh, think of a, of, a, of a double glazed window as a bad insulator, it, it, it'll help you once you have that mindset, then you know, you'll be less inclined to, to have windows that are bigger than they should be. Because often, often double glazing becomes a, a way of uh, allowing people to have windows that are really bigger than they, they should be. If double glazing is just better than single glazing, what's optimal glazing? Well, there's no short answer to that. Um, I encourage double glazing, but it's just by itself, it's not enough. Um, yeah. So if it's triple glazing on that, is it marketing stuff or is it actually do something? No. Okay, going from single to double glazing um, halves the heat flow. Um, uh, so it's a ratio of two to one. Uh, going from uh, double uh, to triple glazing uh, is a ratio of uh, two to three. So, so get two thirds of the heat flow through a triple glazed window as you would through a double glazed window. So it's the ratio of the number of, of surfaces. Where do they stick on the films? The films fit in that uh, little radiant. No, no. no. <laughs> stick on, well, it's complicated. <laughs> We're trying to touch over the, a, a, a lot of stuff here. Why don't we save some of this detail till, till the end if we've got time otherwise we'll get bogged down in, in individual categories. Um, so uh, let's come back to that if we have time. So step five, appliances and cooking. Um, so you might have redundant devices or things that, um, if, if the device is not redundant, they might be on more than they need to be. Um, I'll give you an example. If you've got an electric cooktop, um, these days it's a requirement that near the cooktop there has to be a switch uh, so that the cooktop can be isolated. And the electric cooktops are supposed to be on their own circuit and it, there's a switch in the kitchen near the cooktop. Um, electric cooktops have a standby power consumption, so often people just think of that switch as sort of, sort of an emergency, you know, if you have to turn it off in an emergency, but don't treat it like that. Treat it as they turn it off when you, at the switch on the wall when you're not using it, so that the standby power associated with, the, with that cooktop is no longer drawn. Um, little things like that, they all add up. Same for reduction? Yeah, definitely. Um, consider efficiency when buying appliances. Um, a lot of classes of appliance have a star rating system associated with them. Um, I'm a 
a big fan of induction electric cooktops. Aside from being very efficient, they provide uh, a great way of moving away from gas cooktops, which are otherwise kind of the dominant way that people tend to cook uh, these days. Uh, heating and cooling. Um, I would say, as a general rule, avoid ducted systems. Um, there's a whole raft of problems associated with ducting, cover and depth in the book. Um, heat pumps are a key technology, not just for heating and cooling, but for hot water as well. Um, in a very real sense, heat pumps as a technology uh, allow the harvesting of ambient renewable heat. So. A lot of people don't realise that there really are a, a renewable energy technology and that the heat energy in the air around our homes can be harvested uh, in a very real sense. So they are a renewable energy technology. They've come a long way in the last 20 years. They're a lot more efficient and quieter and more reliable than they used to be. And uh, some of them have some really cool additional features which uh, the topic of another discussion. Um, broadly, get rid of gas heating uh, and good heat pump uh, or other classes of devices that will help control uh, energy in and around houses. So I'm, I'm a fan of the tsunami. Um, and depending on your local power distributor, you may or may not have access to a web <coughs> portal that your distributor or your retailer makes available to you. And it's another way of helping you understand your energy use. Log on to that portal, you can see um, your energy use over time. And seasonal and, and yearly, so you can look at trends. It's quite powerful. Okay, the last step, PV. Uh, PV's been in the discussion with this is the subject of many talks in, uh, by the ATA, so I won't labour the point, except to put it in the context of this whole discussion about home energy. Um, I'm of the view that PV has become so much cheaper, therefore it, it, it is in a very real sense a good investment. Uh, in other words, the cost per kilowatt hour generated over the life of the system is actually uh, competitive with cost of energy on the grid. Uh, the degree to which it's financial for you will vary with how much power you are able to consume yourself in your home in real time. So the, the proportion of the solar energy generated that you can consume in real time is called your self-consumption. And as a general rule, uh, the higher your self-consumption, uh, the better the economic performance of your solar panels. And uh, fortuitously, <coughs> if you move to an all-electric home, your self-consumption compared with a gas home um, is likely to be higher because you're using things like uh, heat pump heating uh, to make use of that uh, generation during the day. So there's a synergy between uh, being all-electric your consumption of energy and the use of PV. Um, as a general rule, uh, PV installation of around 5 kilowatts can, can uh, generate enough energy across the course of the year to offset uh, the, all the energy use in a, in a home. That, that's certainly in my experience. Um, I'd advise you to go for quality in, in purchasing PV uh, because you should view it as an, as an investment that will hopefully last in the order of 20 to 25 years. Okay, in framing this discussion about um, a stepwise approach to achieving demand reduction um, through you know, a baseline energy use here and the different uh, stages of energy freedom, Lighting, um, passive upgrades, uh, heating and cooling, hot water, uh, electric cooking, um, monitoring and control. Uh, so that, that's a sort of a theoretical look at 
energy reduction in a home that we did as part of Zero Carbon Australia Buildings Plan. Uh, and that was modelled off a typical uh, Melbourne house. And the idea was that once you've achieved these reductions, then the, the solar energy generated over the course of the year um, offsets this amount entirely. And so you're left with some net amount, which in this example is, 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 is a, a slight surplus of energy. Now that, that was a theoretical view. We did some modelling and, and that was what we believe was possible, but um, this is actual. Uh, this happens to be my house. Um, it's what I've done over seven years. Um, the blue, uh, each bar is a month. Uh, the blue bars are electrical consumption, the, the red bars are gas consumption. Uh, the, the, it's seasonal, you can see you've got a peak in the middle of each year. Uh, the first year is 2006. That was, that's what I consider my baseline year. That was the, the last year before I started making substantial improvements. And over the course of seven years, we managed to get the use down. Uh, end of 2011, we disconnected from gas, as you can see, no more uh, red there. So the electricity use in 2012 has gone up slightly with respect to 2011. But as you can see, um, it's, it's still, uh, in terms of overall energy use, a significant reduction. So, so now, that, that's 2013, um, that's a 75% reduction uh, compared to 2006. And so that, that lined up pretty well with the, the modelling we did uh, for the building plan. So is that actually net zero? Uh, it is if you exclude my electric cars. So, in conclusion, achieving energy freedom is a journey. It's uh, start on it, and even if it's going to take you a few years, it's, it's going to be a journey well worth taking. So, thank you very much. Any questions? We'll start with your question, which was about the film. I think the uh, film on Windows. Yeah. What do you think of that? Okay. Uh, it's more beneficial in a hot climate. Um, generally, those uh, films that can be applied to the surface of a window help control the radiation through the window. So uh, going from a single glazed window to a double glazed window does very little to, to stop sunlight coming through and carrying heat with it. So um, the other thing films can do is lower the emissivity of the, of the window, um, which helps reduce the, the way the heat is carried through thermal emission. Um, and are there better and worse film materials used yeah, in the market? So, so um, I, as a general rule, I'd consider them as a second order benefit. And the first order benefits in improving windows come from going from single phase to double phase. And if you want to get better still, then perhaps look at, um, especially in Melbourne's climate, in a, in a very hot climate where a lot of the heat comes from the radiation through the windows, uh, in those climates it's certainly worth uh, putting tinting on the windows to stop the heat coming in. I just, just to comment on that. The, most of those films are just tinting. So they might halve your summer sun coming in, but they also halve your winter sun. What you really want is external shading, so you stop 100% of your summer sun, and 0% of your winter sun. Yeah. So that's why the only other film, the low E films, are useful, but they're quite complicated. So what do they do? The low E film? Yeah, they, they reduce the, well, as a general um, principle, metallic surfaces have a lower emissivity than non-metallic surfaces. And low E surfaces use a metallic coating, very thin metallic coating. Uh, and lower emissivity surfaces radiate less. Uh, so if you were looking at it with a thermal imaging camera, it wouldn't look as bright for a given, temp for a given temperature. So yeah, they, they can lower the heat. Um, up the back. I was just going to comment, in terms of uh, stopping heat getting in, I've had very successful results using that red shade and just putting it up in summer and then yeah. taking it down in winter. Yeah. 
radiation control is important. Uh, down the front. Good day. Thanks, Richard. Uh, the non-sexy thing, draft proofing. Yeah. And uh, I'm sort of well aware at our relatively new home that uh, around my front door it's it leaks like a sieve. Yeah. And I've really struggled to find a good product which is about sealing around that front door and how you know what what you've come across in your travels. Uh, well, as it happens, I, I do this stuff day to day for a living, so I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I work for a company called EcoMaster. Um, we do professional draft roofing, insulation, and secondary repairs. Um, but as a general proposition, uh, yes, doors are often sealed very poorly, and one of the reasons. I've come to appreciate this over the last few months is that um, very often the door is slightly warped. In other words, it doesn't uniformly uh, fit in the door jam because there's a slight warp to it. So if it fits in there, you have one side and that's slight, slightly uh, non-fitting on the other side. And very often around the, where, where a door, uh, when a door closes, there's a latch in the middle. Very often um, it will seal best near the latch, but if you you get the draft top and bottom. So the further away from the latch you go, um, go. The, the worse the seal. So we, we've got products that deal with that. And yeah, we can, we can achieve good seals. There's good seals on the bottom from Raven, which are readily yeah. available. Yeah. Yep. I think it's a mind to tell you. Automatic ones that, that lock down. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's hundreds of different draft roofing products from low tech to high tech. Uh, yeah. Um, I recently put in an induction cooker. Yeah. And the electrician suggested I go up to an ATM uh, circuit. You, the electrician suggested you. I should upgrade to an ATM circuit from a 50 amp circuit. Volume. So the question was, or well, the observation was that um, in putting in an induction cooktop, the electrician recommended a higher current. Circuit. Because of the high boost current yeah. on well, startup. That'll. That may be true for a particular model. So an electrician will just look at the specs on a cooktop, whether it be induction or not induction, and, and just recommend a circuit to match. Uh, so um, as it Yeah, a fellow at work put one in, he's an electric he's an electrician and he the same thing. They are like a forty amp rating or something, which is quite dramatic. Yeah. yeah. Eight mm. eight square mil uh, cable and you have to have you have to have something you have to have a direct Isolating switch, which mm. gets quite large, or a contact that you have to have something. Well, oh, we didn't put that in. No, you just need a, a switch. Yeah, a bit, um, yeah. But, contact um, breakers. Yeah. Any any electric cooktop these days to meet the, the wiring code needs its own isolated circuit, yeah, and it'll right. be at least 15 amp. And I, I've never heard of one needing an 80 amp circuit. That sounds absurd. Um, I think you must be talking well, about the whole load with well, the, the whole top load. on with everything else on. Are you talking about yeah. upgrading the main the circuit yeah. to the house because yeah. to the house, yes. Oh, yeah. Which is quite expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've got to put on a new circuit from Catenary, yeah, yeah, from yeah. wherever. Then you might need a different Induction no, we told him. <laughs> we told him to get stuffed because we will never, ever have all rings on boost at yeah. the same time. Yeah, yeah. We will not do it. Yeah. So we told him to get yeah. stuffed, and that's actually quite fair. Yeah. They, they don't. There's a diversity argument in yes. in the code that says you don't have to rate it for everything yes. to be on at once. Yeah. yeah, to follow on from that. Um, on a trip back to the UK last year, I was looking at cooktops and they seem to have a smarter way of doing things there than we do here. They have cooktops which have built-in intelligence which will not exceed a given load at any one time. It will, it will not go on to boost on all the yeah. Why the heck they're not available over here, I don't know. I, found them yet. Well, I don't know if it's got that facility or not. My induction cooktop is a Bosch, yeah, and um, each of the elements can go from zero to nine and then have a P setting, which is like power. And only one of them can be on P at a time. Mm -hmm. okay. so, yeah. Yeah. I'm going back to that last graph you showed, Richard, with the red and blue. Yeah. Um, that, uh, 
there. Now, uh, you've given them there both in megajoules per day. Yeah. Is that megajoules at the house meter, or is that megajoules, in the case of electricity, at the generator? Delivered to the house. Right, so, so in terms of emissions, they're not really the same scale, are they? Well, it's megajoules of gas at the house and megajoules of electricity to the house, so. Yeah, but the megajoules that you get at the house have already gone through the inefficiencies of getting it all the way. That's, to that's well understood, but it's quite reasonable to, to oh, no, meet no, it at the house. So I'll just ask you the question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Now, just a comment on the, the Zigbee. I've yeah. got Osnet set up and they still do not support Zigbee. Yeah. Maybe next year. I asked them and they said we won't tell you when we'll support it. Mm. Yeah. So 2017 is when they're supposed to have it all right. Yeah, so uh, 16 was when, or 15 was when they're supposed to have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, so the meters themselves have this capability <coughs> and for it to be available to consumers, so there's a whole bunch of back end stuff that the distributors have to have ready and working. And Osnet, um, uh, that's being Mikati. The other city power and Gemini had theirs running for over three years. And I just want to make another point. Hang on. Sorry. No. Um, I have a, uh, I can't do anything about it now. I've got a wall in, in the cross the room of windows from the <coughs> yeah. which is very pleasant to look out on. But all the woodwork is rotting, and I'm doing something about all the rotting woodwork. Now, what is the ideal? It's unlikely I'll be able to afford it, but what is the ideal? And also, at right angles, there is another shorter wall, too. There's a, like a three metre by, and with a, with a glass door. So I've got, I already have screen, and I already have heavy medium line uh, drawstring curtains. And I, I have um, deciduous trees, mature ones, all around the whole house. So that's, I've done what I can there. If, if your window frames are rotting, yeah. and investing in improving those windows, mm. you might not be money well spent. So I'd have to have a look. Mm. You may need, in that case, to replace the entire window with, with a new sealed double glazed unit. As a general proposition, a timber frame windows in good condition can usually be fitted with secondary glazing, that is, keeping the existing window frame and, and, and glazing and fitting um, a uh, perspex element over the top in a way that gives you performance equivalent to um, and very close to as good as new seal double glazing. And it's cheaper. And much cheaper than putting it all out. And middle ground is something that I know Alan knows a lot about. Alan Cuthbertson here and the business called DIY Double Glaze, which is a, a, a middle ground between that where you keep the same frame, but you remove the glazing and fit in its place, and you remove the sheet of glass and put a, a new seal double glaze uh, unit in its place. So, so you've got a range of choices there from pulling out the whole window and replacing it with a new double glazed window um, to taking out the sheet of glass and putting in a double glaze um, element to keeping the sheet of glass and putting in perspex uh, thing as part of the system, like what EcoBlaze sell, uh, what, what EcoMaster sell called the EcoBlaze as a product of the company that I work with. Okay. So you've got a bunch of choices. Uh, yes, I hope ATA can run something in a magazine or not at some time. And if anybody knows of anybody who can do this very well, <laughs> I would re recommend that one. Um, so you get together. I put in some double glaze units from Alan, and then I've taken the old sheets of glass out and then made my own double glazing using the old the glass. Yeah. And that has come out remarkably well, which Alan will agree with me. Not quite as good as the double glaze units, but it's come out really quite well. Um, and that saves you. But with the glass, and it's also environmentally quite better. The, the, the number nine step you had was direct PV. Yeah. Um, but of course, you can collect solar directly through the windows. 30 years ago, I bought a timber house, and one of the benefits of that was it enabled me to just take out the small windows and swap them with the big windows, 
by making small changes so as to get the big windows on the north side and the small windows on the south side because the house has been built the long way around as they often are. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, there's a lot to be gained by doing that. We increased the north facing windows by I think it was four square metres yeah. and consequently reduced them on the south and that's it's quite a significant difference. Yeah, you talk about the, the, the passive solar design of the house. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in, a, in framing these approaches, we've assumed that most people will not be able to change this mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. solar, passive solar characteristics mm -hmm. of their house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good that you were able to do that, but we've not, and, and I recognise the, the absolute importance of good passive solar design. But we're coming at this from the point of view of retrofitting in most houses. That, you know, most people don't have the, the option of fundamentally changing the passive solar characteristics of the house. Yeah. Do you guys do draft door tests or anything like that? No. Uh, Barrier Technology, a company in Melbourne, do blow door tests. Yeah, because it was a roughly, um, I don't think it was my latest program, explanation of that. Lower door test. Okay. Um, to quantify how well sealed the house is, there is a technology or is a method called the blower door test where you seal up and close all the windows and, and doors and, and, and you fit uh, a large pair of blowers with you know, stick it on the, on the door and basically <coughs> try to pressurise the entire house. And by measuring the back pressure through the blower, you're able to measure how well sealed the house is and there's a measurement called the air changes per hour at 50 pascals of pressure. Uh, that's a standard measurement of, of how well sealed the house is. So, uh, so and a common house would be? Well, something less than one is really good and something more than 10 is really bad. But mm. frequently it'll be close to 100 maybe? Uh, or other classes of device that will help control uh, energy in and around houses. I'm a fan of tsunamis. Um, and depending on your local power distributor, you may or may not have access to a web <coughs> portal that your distributor or your retailer makes available to you. And it's another way of helping you understand your energy use. Log on to that portal, you can see um, your energy use uh, over time and seasonal and, and yearly, so you can look at trends. It's quite powerful. Okay, the last step, PV. Uh, PV's been in the discussion with this, the subject of many talks in, uh, by the ATA, so I won't labor the point, except to put it in the context of this whole discussion about home energy. Um, I'm of the view that uh, PV has become so much cheaper, therefore it, it, it is in a very real sense a good investment. Uh, in other words, the cost per kilowatt hour generated over the life of the system is actually uh, competitive with uh, the cost of energy on the grid. Uh, the degree to which it's financial for you will vary with how much power you are able to consume yourself in your home in real time. So the, the proportion of the solar energy generated that you can consume in real time is called your self-consumption. And as a general rule, uh, the higher your self-consumption, uh, the better the economic performance of your solar panels. And uh, fortuitously, <coughs> if you move to an all-electric home, your self-consumption compared with a gas home um, is likely to be higher because you're using things like uh, heat pump heating make use of that uh, generation during the day. So there's a synergy between uh, being all electric uh, for, for your consumption of energy and the use of PV. Um, as a general rule, uh, PV installation of around 5 kilowatts can, can uh, generate enough energy across the course of the year to offset uh, the all the energy use in a, in a home. That, that's certainly my experience. Um, I'd advise you to go for quality in, in purchasing PV uh, because 
you should view it as an in, as an investment that will hopefully last in the order of 20 to 25 years. Okay, in framing this discussion about um, a stepwise approach to achieving demand reduction um, through you know, a baseline energy use here uh, in the different uh, stages of energy freedom, um, lighting, um, passive upgrades, uh, heating and cooling, hot water, uh, electric cooking, um, monitoring and control. Uh, so that, that's a sort of a theoretical look at energy reduction in a home that we did as part of Zero Carbon Australia Buildings Plan. Uh, and that was modelled off a typical uh, Melbourne house. And the idea was that once you've achieved these reductions, then the, the solar energy generated over the course of the year um, offsets this amount entirely. And so you're left with some net amount, which in this example is, 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 is a, a slight surplus of energy. Now, that, that was a theoretical view. We did some modelling, and, and that was what we believe was possible, but um, this is actual. Uh, this happens to be my house. Um, it's what I've done over seven years. Um, the blue, uh, each bar is a month. Uh, the blue bars are electrical consumption, the, the red bars are gas consumption. Uh, the, the, it's seasonal, you can see you've got a peak in the middle of each year. Uh, the first year is 2006. That was, that's what I consider my baseline year. That was the, the last year before I started making substantial improvements. And over the course of seven years, we've managed to get the use down. Uh, end of 2011, we disconnected from gas, as you can see, no more uh, red there. So the electricity use in 2012 has gone up slightly with respect to 2011. But as you can see, um, it's, it's still, uh, in terms of overall energy use, a significant reduction. So, so now, that, that's 2013, um, that's a 75% reduction uh, compared to 2006. And so that, that lined up pretty well with the, the modelling we did uh, for the buildings plan. So is that actually net zero? Uh, it is if you exclude my electric cars. So, in conclusion, achieving energy freedom is a journey. It's uh, start on it, and even if it's going to take you a few years, it's, it's going to be a journey well worth taking. So, thank you very much. Any questions? We'll start with your question, which was about the film, I think. The film on Windows. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's more beneficial in a hot climate. Um, generally, those uh, films that can be applied to the surface of a window help control the radiation through the window. So uh, going from a single glazed window to a double glazed window does very little to, to stop sunlight coming through and carrying heat with it. So um, the other thing films can do is lower the emissivity of the, of the window, um, which helps reduce the, the way the heat is carried through thermal emission. Um, and are there better and worse film materials used yeah, in the market? So, so um, I, as a general rule, I consider them as a second order benefit. And the first order benefits in improving windows come from going from single phase to double phase. And if you want to get better still, then perhaps look at, um, especially in Melbourne's climate, in a, in a very hot climate where a lot of the heat comes from the radiation through the windows, uh, in those climates it's certainly worth uh, putting tinting on the windows to stop the heat coming in. I just, I just to comment on that. The, most of those films are just tinting. So they might halve your summer sun coming in, but they also halve your winter sun. What you really want is external shading, so you stop 100% of your summer sun, and zero percent of your winter sun. Yeah. So that's why the only other film, the low E films, are useful, but they're quite complicated. So what do they do? 
the low E bill. Yeah, they, they reduce the, well, as a general um, principle, metallic surfaces have a lower emissivity than non-metallic surfaces. And low E surfaces use a metallic coating, very thin metallic coating. Uh, and lower emissivity surfaces radiate less. Uh, so if you were looking at it with a thermal imaging camera, it wouldn't look as bright for a given, temp for a given temperature. So yeah, they, they can lower the heat. Um, up the back. I was just going to comment, in terms of uh, stopping heat getting in, I've had very successful results using that red shade and just putting it up in summer and then yeah. taking it down in the winter. Yeah. Yep. Radiation control is important. Uh, down the front. G'day. Thanks, Richard. Uh, the non-sexy thing, draft proofing. Yeah. And uh, I'm sort of well aware at our relatively new home that uh, around my front door it's, it leaks like a sieve. Yeah. And I've really struggled to find a good product which is about sealing around that front door and how, you know, what, what you've come across in your travels? Uh, well, as it happens, I, I do this stuff day to day for a living, so I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I work for a company called Ecomaster. Um, we do professional draft roofing, insulation, and secondary phase. Um, but as a general proposition, uh, yes, doors are often sealed very poorly, and one of the reasons I've come to appreciate this over the last few months is that um, very often the door is slightly warped. In other words, it doesn't uniformly uh, fit in the door jam because there's a slight warp to it. So if it fits in there, you on one side and it's slight, slightly uh, non-fitting on the other side. And very often around the, where, where a door, when the door closes, there's a latch in the middle. Very often um, it'll seal best near the latch, but if you you get the draft top and bottom. So the further away from the latch you go, um, yeah. the, the worse the seal. So we, we've got products that deal with that. And yeah, we can, we can achieve good seals. There's good seals on the bottom from Raven, which are readily yeah. available. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Might tell the the automatic ones that, that lock down. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's hundreds of different draft roofing products from low tech to high tech. Uh, yeah. Um, I recently put in an induction cooker. Yeah. And the electrician suggested I go up to an 80 amp uh, circuit. You, the electrician suggested you. I should upgrade to an 80 amp circuit from a 50 amp circuit. Amp. So the question was, or well, the observation was that um, in putting in an induction cooktop, the electrician recommended a higher current. Circuit. Because of the high boost current yeah. on well, startup. That'll. That may be true for a particular model. So an electrician will just look at the specs on a cooktop, whether it be induction or not induction, and, and just recommend a circuit to match. Uh, so, um, as a yeah, a fellow at work put one in. He's an, electri he's an electrician, and he the same thing. They, they're like a 40 amp rating or something, which is quite dramatic. Yeah, yeah. Eight, mm. eight square mil uh, cable. And you, have to have, you, have to have some, you have to have a direct isolating switch which mm. gets quite large or a contact so you have to have something well, quite well, quite no, we didn't put that in no, you just need a, a switch yeah, a bit, um, yeah. But, contact um, bankers yeah. any any electric cooktop these days to meet the, the wiring code needs its own isolated circuit yeah, and it'll right. be at least 15 amp and I, I've never heard of one needing an 80 amp circuit that sounds absurd um, I think you must be talking well, about the whole load with well, the, the whole cooktop load. is on with everything else on. Are oh, you talking about yeah. upgrading the main circuit to the house because to the house, yes. Oh, yeah. Which is quite expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta put on a new circuit from Catenary, yeah, yeah, from yeah. wherever. Then you might need a different induction cooktop. <laughs> no, we told him <laughs> we told him to get stuffed because <laughs> we will never ever have all rings on boost at yeah. the same time. Yeah, yeah. We will not do it. Yeah. So we told them to get yeah. stuff and that's actually quite fair. Yeah. They, they don't, there's a diversity argument in yes. in the code that says you don't have to rate it for everything yes. to be on at once. Good.
Yeah, yeah, to follow on from that, uh, on a trip back to the UK last year, I was looking at cooktops, and they seem to have a smarter way of doing things there than we do here. They have cooktops which have built-in intelligence which will not exceed a given load at any one time. It will, it will not go on to boost on all on, yeah, on all the yeah. Why the heck they're not available over here, I don't know. But I haven't found them yet. Well, I don't know if it's got that facility or not. I had actually cooked up in the Bosch, yeah, and um, each of the elements can go from zero to nine and then have a P setting, which is like power. And only one of them can be on P at a time. Mm -hmm. okay. so, yeah. Yeah. I'm going back to that last scratch you showed, Richard, with the yeah, red and blue. Yeah. Um, that has a there. Now, uh, you've given them there both in megajoules per day. Yeah. Is that megajoules at the house meter, or is that megajoules in the case of electricity at the generator? Delivered to the house. Right. So, so in terms of emissions, they're not really the same scale, are they? Well, it's megajoules of gas at the house and megajoules of electricity at the house. So. Yeah, but the megajoules that you get at the house have already gone through the inefficiencies of getting it all the way. That's, that's what well understood, but it's quite reasonable to, to oh, no, meet no, it no, at the no, house. So I'll just ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Just, oh. just a comment on the, the Zigbee. Yeah. I've got Osnet set up and they still do not support Zigbee. Yeah. Maybe next year. I asked them and they said, we won't tell you when we support it. Mm. Yeah. So 27 is when it's supposed to have it all. Yeah, so uh, 16 was when, or 15 was when I was supposed to have yeah, 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 true. Yeah, so the meters themselves have this capability and for it to be available to consumers, so there's a whole bunch of back-end stuff that the distributors have to have ready and working. And Osnet, um, uh, that's being with Tardy, the other City Power and Gemini, had theirs running for over three years. And I just want to make another point. Um, I have a, uh, I can't do anything about it now, I've got a wall in, in the cross planning room of windows from the <coughs> wall, yeah. which is very pleasant to look out on. But all the woodwork is rotting and I'm doing something about all the rotting woodwork. Now, what is the ideal? It's unlikely I'll be able to afford it, but what is the ideal? And also, at right angles, there is another shorter wall, too. There's a, like a three metre by. And with the, with the glass door. So I've got, I already have screen, I already have heavy medium line to uh, draw screen curtains. And I, I have um, deciduous trees, mature ones, all around the whole house. So that's, I've done what I can there. Yeah. So if, a, if your window frames are rotting, yeah. then investing in improving those windows mm. might not be money well spent. So I'd have to have a look. Mm. You may, in that case to replace the entire window with, with a new sealed double glazed unit. As a general proposition, a timber frame windows in good condition can usually be fitted with secondary glazing. That is, keeping the existing window frame and, and, and glazing and fitting um, a uh, perspex element over the top in a way that gives you performance equivalent to um, very close to as good as new seal double glazing. And it's cheaper. And much cheaper than putting it all out. And middle ground is something that I know Alan knows a lot about. Alan Cuthbertson here and the business called DIY Double Glaze, which is a, a, a middle ground between that, where you keep the same frame, but you remove the glazing and fit in its place. And you remove the sheet of glass and put a, a new seal double glaze uh, unit in its place. So, so you've got a range of choices there from pulling out the whole window and replacing it with a new double glazed window um, to taking out the sheet of glass and putting in a double glazed um, element to keeping the sheet of glass and putting in perspex um, thing as part of the system like what EcoGlaze sell, uh, what, what EcoMaster sell called EcoGlaze as a product of the company that I work for. So you've got a bunch of choices. Uh, yes, I hope ATA can run something in the magazine or not at some time. And if anybody knows of anybody who can 
do this very well. Um, <laughs> I would re recommend that one. Um, so you get together. I put in some double glass units from Alan, and then I've taken the old sheets of glass out and then made my own double glazing using the old the glass. Yeah. And that has come out remarkably well, which um, will agree with me. Not quite as good as the double glass units, but it's come out really quite well. Um, and that saves you that bit of glass, and it's also environmentally quite better. Which is the, 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 ninth, the number nine step you had was direct TV. Yeah. Um, but of course, you can collect solar directly through the windows. 30 years ago, I bought a timber house, and one of the benefits of that was it enabled me to just take out the small windows and swap them with the big windows by making small changes so as to get the big windows on the north side and the small windows on the south side because the house had been built the wrong way around as they often are. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, there's a lot to be gained by doing that. We increased the north facing windows by I think it was four square metres yeah. and consequently reduced them on the south and that's it's quite a significant difference. Yeah, you talk about the, the, the passive solar design of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in framing these approaches, we've assumed that most people will not be able to change this general mm -hmm. solar, passive solar characteristics mm -hmm. of their house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good that you were able to do that, but we've not, and, and I recognise the, the absolute importance of good passive solar design. But we're coming at this from the point of view of retrofitting in most houses. That, you know, most people don't have the, the option of fundamentally changing the passive solar characteristics of the house. Yeah. Do you guys do draft door tests or anything like that? No. Uh, barrier technology are a company in Melbourne that do blow door tests. Yeah, because it was a roughly, um, I don't think it was my explanation of that. Either. They might not have heard it or well, we'll do a test. Okay. Um, to quantify how well sealed the house is, there is a technology or is a method called the blower door test where you seal up, you close all the windows and, and doors, and, and, and you fit uh, a large pair of blowers with you know, stick it on the, on the door. And basically, <coughs> try to pressurize the entire house. And by measuring the back pressure through the blower, you're able to measure how well sealed the house is and there's a measurement called the air changes per hour at 50 pascals of pressure uh, that's a standard measurement of, of how well sealed the house is so, uh, so and a common house would be well something less than one is really good and something more than 10 is really bad but frequently they'll be close to 100 maybe but you want to get it lower and really high but it's not unusual to see very, very high numbers because of a fundamental disconnect between how a house is supposed to be built and how it actually gets built in the end. There's often shortcuts or mistakes made in the building process that lead to inadvertent or otherwise undiscovered. I was in a house today, built in the 80s, brick veneer, typical plaster walls, plaster ceiling, cornice. Um, the house had not yet, the, you know, the, owner, the owner had just taken possession of the house. So in the fridge cavity, there was no fridge. So I was able to step into the fridge cavity and look up. Yeah. And, and where the, in that section above where the fridge was, where the ceiling met the wall, Seems where like there should have been a piece of cornice, there was no cornice at all for, yeah. the, for about two and a half metres. So you, you had a, a, a gap about that wide and about two and a half metres long, complete hole into the ceiling. And that's just a, a shortcut or a, an oversight at the point of construction. And, and even houses that are new, I've been to new houses out, I did look at some houses that are less than, less than five years old and, and they've got some horrible issues with them in terms of the way the insulation's installed or other things. Yeah, so even new houses that are designed to six stars are very often, if you actually tested them, they would not achieve six stars. Not they might not achieve half. Isn't the answer to all that really uh, to do what 
England and uh, Germany, I think, do, and, and that is you don't get your, well, my understanding, you don't kind of get an occupancy until you do a pressure test almost or, yeah. or a rating. Yeah, I, I, in, I'm, in a post construction thing. Yeah. We designed for six stars, but we deliver four perhaps. Yeah, uh, another good example of where shortcuts are made in terms of um, building to the standard is um, the design of the house in terms of how much insulation is put in um, will assume that the ceiling insulation and, and, and uh, downlines um, are such that you've got a certain amount of insulation but when, when it actually gets built you know, there's big holes around the insulation, uh, uh, big holes in the ceiling around the downlights. Mm. The downlights are ventilated when they probably designed not to be. You know, on, the, on the spec, they're probably not supposed to be ventilated. So you end up with heavily compromised insulation, heavily compromised draft roofing, um, and, and the, the build that doesn't match the actual design spec. So yes, I, I'd support the general proposition that we need um, better checking of compliance of new homes and significant renovations. Uh, uh, last year I put in, um, I changed 30 allergen downlights to LEDs. I know EK Master Maurice uh, advised me to get rid of them all, and, but anyway, I wasn't brave enough to do that. Um, and um, I had two kilowatts of solar put in and a new hot water service, much to the horror people here, it's a continuous one. Um, uh, but I, I, I had problems with sp not enough space for a heat pump or a solar thing or whatever. Um, and uh, what else? Something else. But I found, and the insulation, uh, the, the uh, power insulation. But I found one of my main problems was that I could not access the standards. You know, to, to actually uh, find out what the standards were, you had to pay hundreds of dollars, if I remember rightly, to yeah. actually get them. And I'm wondering whether this organisation or a, a you might know of another organisation could push, but that kind of basic information to be yeah. uh, freely available because your hands were tied. You didn't. I'm still trying to find out whether with the hot water service, the 44-year-old original pipe should have been, you know, redone, relaid or not. And nobody would come out and say whether they should, and they just quite, you know, I, I they, they just you. roll their eyes. I can help you in that, and I can show you the same. Oh, good. But, but the general yeah. proposition that there should be public access to Australian standards, yes. I, I would support that. I think it's problematic that the, the, Australian, the Australian Standards Association is, is run, needs to, to run through the sales of the standards. But it's public, there's a public good proposition, a public good issue there. We and and, and I also that. found that the inspections were very poor quality. You know, when I got in inspectors here, uh, the, you know, yeah. we went to look at the solar panels. The, the, the auditor of the inspector didn't even get up and check. Uh, uh, I was complaining the original inspector didn't do it, but then the, you know, the authorities didn't do it either. Uh, there's, a, there's an alliance between Get Up and Solar Citizen. I had a meeting last night, oh. and they are uh, uh, engaging on a platform of dealing with those sorts of issues across the board. Oh. You all these things about funny regulations and things you can't get access to. Uh, Miriam's the person that who's Miriam involved at get that. Up. Yes. Miriam at Get Up. Cool. And, and they, they launched their deal yesterday um, you know, at the Wheeler Centre, and that would be a good place to take an issue just like that. I, I, I was horrified with every one yeah. of my things I've had problems. They're still not solved. And uh, I came to the conclusion we're a very unskilled country. But perhaps if the standards were... Um, Miriam's uh, name's on the back of it. That's it. Okay. Apparently, this is the Get Up Solar Citizens campaign. What's that one? The homegrown and power plant. Is that a Get Up thing? It's Get yeah. Up and Solar get Citizens. Up. It was launched by Ross Garner last night. Get Up and Solar Citizens. Solar Citizens, who are promoting uh, solar PV. The homegrown power plant. The, 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 the email address is on the back there. Oh, good. Mm. Thank you. Getup.org.au slash HPP. Okay. Have I had any experience retrofitting insulation in divorce? Uh, yes, I've done it myself. I've had it done in my own house. 
there's um, not many people in Victoria doing it. There is one company uh, that I know of that's called Enviroflex that do it. Uh, Sorry? Enviroflex. Um, but uh, Eco Master have had some problems with referrals, with quality from Enviroflex. So uh, you want your mileage may vary, as they say. Do you want to explain what that would be awesome? Um, my house was done by another company that was originally based in Sydney. They started operating in Melbourne with the pumping foam insulation. But they found that they couldn't operate year round in Melbourne because this, the foam needed to go in during the warm months of the year uh, because it's water based and um, if it was done in colder weather, it caused problems. So they, they don't do it anymore in Melbourne. Um, but uh, yes, there, there's another company in Canberra that EcoMaster is looking at partnering with, uh, so watch this space. So uh, it's, is that for brick veneer homes or? Yeah, it, most, is it for the many homes can, 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 can have all the, the 50 mil for the yes. space. So yes, uh, I have it on good authority that uh, okay. this blow-in insulation can be uh, installed in many homes, uh, weatherboard, brick veneer. Apparently, a lot more common in Canberra than it is in Melbourne. Because, yeah, of, the, cold. because of the weather up there, it means it's a lot more important. I got here, I'm sorry, you go for a a quick one about hot water. Yeah. In your presentation, you talked about um, heat pump system being superior to um, solar hot yeah. water systems yeah. in general. If one already has a solar hot water system, I would imagine it is better to take off the gas boost and replace it with a, a heat pump boost rather than taking out the solar hot water system and yeah. just putting in a, a plain yeah. heat pump uh, system. Yes, uh, that's actually what I've done. So I've got a hybrid heat pump and, and evacuated tube system. Mm -hmm. And it works very well, but we don't recommend it as a, as a general proposition because uh, it's just too expensive. So you have a diminishing return. Yep. So if uh, if a if a heat pump if a good heat pump system might give you um, in the order of seventy five to eighty five percent reduction in energy relative to a reference conventional system, uh, and a hybrid system might take that from down, down to ninety to ninety five percent reduction. Is it worth paying an extra three or four thousand mm -hmm. dollars to go from arguably eighty percent to with that extra five ten percent, it's probably not worth the extra expense. You're better off putting that in other things. So that's the conclusion I've arrived at. I've been very happy with my system, but as a general idea, it's probably not worth the money. Uh, yeah, a friend of mine just, uh, and I've got the same problem at home. I have a a storage gas hot water service that's about 18 years old, still in pretty good nick actually, I had to do it myself because the service companies don't want to do anything with them. But anyway, it, I, I'm thinking about if it fails, I need to have something in place. And a friend of mine's just had the same problem, he lives up in the, in the country, yeah. and he was looking at, he had LPG, an LPG hot water service, which was a storage type. So anyway, he was looking, there's a local person who does sand and pump, heat pump yeah. systems and everything. Yeah. But the cost of installation, like I think it was about twenty eight hundred for the unit or something after because it wasn't going from electricity. If you have some electricity, there's more rebates. But twenty eight about twenty eight hundred. Then the installation of pipes and bits and pieces was another thousand or fifteen hundred. Then he went he went on eBay and bought a, a Renai instantaneous LPG for eight hundred dollars. It's a hell of a lot of it. Takes a long time to pay that back, doesn't it? That's that, yeah. I'm looking that to go down the heat pump track, but it is re relatively <coughs> expensive. Yeah. Uh, are other returns good enough for them? That's the question. Yeah. Like in terms it's of getting out of gas. Yeah. Or, the sand in units are very good. Um, I'm well, surprised at that the uh, cost you described that they sound a little on the high side. Because there's, in terms of the way they are plumbed, yeah. Uh, but he had to move some gas poles and some gas line yeah. in that, so that's where the issue came yeah. on. As a general idea, if you've got a conventional gas hot water in the storage unit, a sand and heat pump system should just, just hook in, hook, in, hook straight in yeah. using the same pump. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was a lot less, and I would have thought the savings are actually significant. 
Yeah, enough so to, to pay it back. Yeah, you're yeah, still, so you're so still you're talking uh, for a uh, standard, I mean, standard heat pump. It depends, depends on the rebate situation. So the re um, heat pump hot water services qualify for the rebates mm -hmm. under the federal rebates. If you go from electric, they yeah, have but it depends rebates. on what you've already got. That's right. And that was the issue. It's another five hundred dollars in rebates. Yeah. Yeah. With the rebates, it's still a four grand. Yeah, so it's still a, yeah. It's a lot of money. That's a lot of gas, <laughs> or a lot of. You know, that's the that's the line of my. I know people that have paid have paid less than that. Yeah. Depends on who you're getting the provider. Yeah, I would have thought it was cheaper. I think it depends on where you are, whether it pays for itself or not. But anyway, my question was about downlights. Um, yeah. Wondering if you got any ideas about surface downlights, whether they're better than your sealed downlight that you put in well, the ceiling. Ideally, you will not have any penetrations in your ceiling. That's the best case. Mm. Uh, to, to make the house as draft proof as you can. If you were building a new house from scratch, if I was building a new house from scratch, I wouldn't have any penetrations uh, in the ceiling at all. Uh, but a good sealed downlight unit uh, can be very, very good. Um, and they fit in the same hole as a, as a conventional downlight would. Mm. So and you can insulate straight over it, can you? Yeah, there's, 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 there's a... Yeah, there's a little that's a, there's this new um, standard, if you like, called IC rating. IC stands for insulation contact. Um, I think it, I think the standard came out of New Zealand, but it's starting to be used here. And IC rated downlight units can either be uh, rated to have the insulation abut or to cover. So when you're looking at IC rating, uh, it'll be either IC butted or IC covered and if it's IC covered then you can cover it with insulation but not any insulation and only a certain amount. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, question about heat pumps again, you talk about heat pumps in relation to replacing gas for hydronic heating, is there any viable heat pumps on the market that's going to send for a, a larger output? For a larger output the climate. Larger output than Sam Larry, good yeah. for really domestic hot water, quantity of heating. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you talk about hydraulic heating, you need probably twice that amount yeah. of heat. You just look yeah, up. There's, there's, right? there's a few. Yeah. There's a few. Yes. That's what they do. Yeah, it works well. It costs a bit. Siddons mm. make some. Uh, there's another one but called TIVI. TIVI. Yeah. There's, no. there's not the top very. Siddons has got a very good COP and a low temperature. Yeah. Another factor with heat pump water is hot water systems and, and hydronic heating systems can conceivably come on at any time based on the thermostatic control. Uh, and they can have a fan noise associated with them. So there's some sensitivity around the noise that they might generate and, and therefore where they might be situated. You're not going to sit one outside a bedroom window if it's open. But the sanding units are extremely quiet. So one of the great benefits is that they've got a great warranty and they're really, really quiet. I've been standing in front of a sanding unit waiting for it to come on, and it's come on and I haven't noticed it before. <laughs> uh, it's so cool. It's like 38 dB, which is like a whisper. Uh, they have to achieve less than 50 dB. The 50 dB is a lot more than 38. Um, and so, yeah, I've had, I know someone who bought a <coughs> unit that brand that I won't name and was so disappointed that he sent it back and got a sand and was very happy because of the noise issue. Tim? Yeah, the other thing about the sand and Alan Pears informed me that um, it's basically got the power of an instantaneous unit. So it comes with a tank that actually, as far as hot water goes, it can instantaneously provide all your hot water needs. So uh, you'd have to look at the, you know, the energy output ratings, but you know, maybe it would be enough for a hydronic system. Now that would depend on how big your house is and how leaky your house is, uh, that sort of thing. If it's a yeah. pretty good thermal house, then maybe you don't need a lot of heat and maybe the salmon could do the job. So uh, it was kind of remarkable that it's actually an instantaneous unit, yeah. but you got to buy a tank so you get your renewable energy credits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sandon 
used to um, allow the use of their systems for hydronic with a couple of vendors who had been certified to do it. But I'm, I'm being made aware recently that they no longer do. So there's no one that I'm aware of uh, providing sand and heat pump or water units for hydronic use. Just because sand and no longer are happy with that use case. I don't know why. But they are, I know they're reliable and I know they're working. Uh, yeah. Is there any way to add extra insulation under a flat roof? Uh, <laughs> any it's yeah. a tricky one. <laughs> um, it's something that comes up often. Um, none of the, none of, there's no easy way. Um, generally, the, you're either faced with lifting, getting a roofing contractor to, to lift the tin, insulating underneath and putting it back. It's a complicated process, coordinating a number of contractors. And if it's hot or wet or windy, then you, you've got a delay, which can blow out your cost. So that, that's a problematic. If, if, the, if the ceiling is reasonably high, you might consider putting a false ceiling underneath it and insulating between the existing ceiling and the false ceiling. Um, uh, another option, if, if what you're mainly worried about is hot weather comfort rather than cold weather comfort, you might consider doing a cool roof surface. Um, Charles Rendig's um, yeah. um, uh, We know Charles. Yeah. Uh, Thermal Shield? So the Thermo Shield. Yeah. Thermo Shield is a company um, that, that does uh, cool roof coatings. Um, and so the basic idea is the, the chemistry of the paint allows it not just to reflect visible light, but it also reflects more infrared light uh, than normal paint does. So it's, it's, uh, it cools, uh, it, it stops the, the roof heating in the sunlight. So it has an effect equivalent to um, added insulation when it's in sunlight. Sometimes these materials are, are, are given an R value. I think that's very misleading because an R value is, is a measurement of conductive heat flow and these things don't, aren't good, aren't, they don't change the, the R value, they just reduce the, the heat load on the surface and they equate it to an R value but it's quite misleading because it doesn't help you at all in winter, it won't help at all on a roof that's shaded. And in Victoria, pretty much a heating climate. Yeah, so yeah. Most, I mean, it's a silver roof anyway, silver tin roof. Yeah. So you're suggesting that the, the paint would be a benefit? A look, yes. yes, in in a hot in climate summer. situation, yeah. if it's in direct sun. So if it's not in direct sun, it doesn't help at all. If it's in winter, it doesn't help at all. But if, if your problem case is that case of direct sun making it too hot, <coughs> then it might give you some benefit. Okay. A cheaper option may be solar panels with an air conditioner. What changes would you make to your PV? What would you like to make to your system as a result of producing electric car? Because you mentioned at the end there that whoops up with your electric car into the equation now. Um, the general idea you're having as much PV as you can is good. Um, I actually have two plug-in cars, um, and, and I'm close to offsetting the energy that one of them uses um, with the, the PV I have at the moment. So I've got I've got five kilowatts, and that's enough to offset power. Almost. But obviously, some yeah, some some cars get used a lot more than others, um, so a, you can't generalise. But uh, batteries are another thing. Uh, it's well understood, but it has a lot of limitations. It's very dense; it doesn't last that well. Um, yeah, but it's real heavy. Yeah, they're very heavy. Just to butt in on that, we are looking at another battery and storage the storage system topic for a meeting later this year, so watch this space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, 
with uh, sliding windows, aluminium sliding windows, which seem to be common as hell in uh, you know, small housing and apartments, is there any option for double glazing or at least yeah. treating those? Yeah. Um, there is a company called Twin Glaze that have a solution that works with aluminium frames. I haven't seen it myself. Um, <coughs> we sometimes refer, uh, like, uh, EcoMaster's EcoGlaze solution that I sell doesn't work with aluminium frames. But um, I, I need to look more into Twin Glaze because I believe that uh, it, it does work with, with aluminium frame windows. Just one but thing with that. Oh, sorry, they don't, they don't fix the problem with the aluminium frame. Yes, no. I was just going to say. So even if you put in a double glazed glazing element yep. um, in an aluminium frame window, you've still got the underlying problem that aluminium is a superb conductor. Sensational. Uh, and so you've got a diminishing return problem. You might improve the glass, but the, the heat conduction through the, the frame is tremendous. Tremendous. Unless you've got a break in the aluminium at the same time. Yeah. So. Up the back. Do you have any tips for insulating a loft hatch or for an attic ladder going up into the, the loft? And essentially, the hatch that was installed by the people was a sheet of plywood. So, there's no insulation there. But I haven't really worked out how I can actually have insulation but still have the folded up ladder sitting up in the loft. Do you want to insulate it or seal it for drafts? Well, Insulating is going to be problematic because the ladder is sitting on the hatch. Um, but sealing it is doable. Um, and maybe sheets of thin stuff like air cell or something might be able yeah. to yeah. improve it. Because if it's pretty thin, you can lay it yeah, on so the table. It would depend, depend on how much of the, uh, the ladder, how much of the back of the hatch is exposed and not covered by the ladder. Apparatus. Well, it does cover the whole lot, but there are only four points going in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so. So, you, you've done it, you said over there with the air cell, and it made any kind of difference? Or I suppose I'd have to borrow the camera to find out. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to borrow the camera to find out. <laughs> yeah, I, so. it, it, it was certainly satisfying, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for the benefit of those who didn't pick it up, what they're suggesting is using a material called um, air cell, which is like bubble wrap, but it's metallized on both sides. So it's, uh, it's about uh, three or four millimeters thick, uh, air gap in the middle, bubbles, and uh, reflective on both sides. Uh, and just fastening that with a staple or glue on the back of a, of a surface, a hatch or something, is a neat way of achieving some degree of insulation in targeted situations. And make sure there's no electrical items. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, the, the, don't go using uh, air cell where there's electrical wires. If you staple through air cell into electrical wire, you may well, um, maybe the last thing you do. Can you do anything about aluminium window frames? We generally, take them out. We generally <laughs> recommend... Well, I haven't built the house yet. Don't, well, don't use there is air break, air break aluminium windows with a frame and an air break and another frame. Yeah. Frame. Yeah. Um, aluminium as a material has obviously got some great properties. There's a picture here in the, in, in, in the Energy yeah. Freedom book of, a, of, of glazing from a company called Miglas, where they use aluminium on the face where it's needed for weatherproofing, to call, but it, it, it connects to a wooden frame. So that gives the best of both worlds. Yeah. So something like that, you've got the durability of aluminium on the fascia with, with the uh, thermal properties of wood behind it. So yeah, there's lots of lots out there. We'll look for terms like thermally broken and thermally improved in windows. There's a rating system for windows called WERS, the Window Energy Rating System. So there's a star rating system for windows. Uh, so yeah, just like you'd buy any other um, product based on, on star rating, you can do it for windows as well. Um, you talked about insulating floors. Yeah. Now, I know the trend at the moment is, is the, has been for a long time, the wooden floors, and yeah. I can understand doing it underneath those, but what about if you have carpet and vinyl done already? Isn't that insulation already? 
uh, a little bit. Mm. I, I can still be in Oh, quite a lot. So oh, really? a bare timber floor, uh, depending on how mobile the air is underneath it, the, the, is about R0.7 with relatively steel air underneath. If, if you have an <coughs> underlay and a carpet, it might go from 0.7 to 0.9 or 0.7 to, to 1. Whereas if you add um, 90 mil of, of, uh, of, of a batting material, uh, we use um, Vortex uh, polyester bat material in rolls, not in bat lengths, and we staple it between the joists in long lengths. Uh, and that, that'll take the, the floor from 0.7 to 3.2, uh, so which is a huge improvement. Um, yeah. well, on the other side of that, if you have ductive heating, which we don't all like, the underfloor area may be, say, 15 or 16 degrees, so you don't actually lose much heat through the floor. Oh. <laughs> because, the, because the gas ducts are leaky, yes. they heat up that area. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't really. And the other thing is that you don't lose heat through the floor in summer, which you'd like to do. No, so insulating but the floor in, in summer, sometimes oh. the air underneath the house might be very hot. Oh, yes. Most um, houses, well, it depends on the. You're right. Yeah. It depends on, but the most houses are very cold room. underneath them if they're brick veneer with a yes. all the way around. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, the, it depends on how yeah. ventilated so under the floor is. I think it's on an elevated yes. block and the cold air freezes. Oh, that's different, yeah. Um, I want to mention skylights mm. because unless they're carefully fitted, they're a huge source of heat in the summer yeah. coming in, but they're a godsend for the light, Yes. Um, and they're also a bit of a hazard when it comes to bushfires, because they're going, they're going to melt mm. with excessive heat. Mm. Uh, there's a great market out there for somebody who could produce a, a shield that lets the light in but keeps the heat off <coughs> and also protects the, the, the surface yeah, yeah, yeah. from ember there, there are two the like. There are two vendors that I know of that give that sell things that are effectively skylights but it's just basically a solar panel and an LED panel and they're connected via a DC cable. So, oh, yeah. so But you can't see the birds through it, can you? You can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no actual penetration through either the roof or the ceiling. So right. that bushfire situation problem goes away. Yes. And, and clearly a, a penetration through roof and ceiling allows a lot of thermal energy to pass uh, conductively and through radiation. See, at the moment we, we climb up on the roof and cover it, we block out curtain material and tie it. Yeah. Tie it down in the summer, but it makes it dark. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a company called Illum, I L L U M E, uh, that, yeah. that sell um, these units uh, of various sizes. That, you know, from so they, so they yeah they, they look just like a a, a, um, a skylight if they're put in. They look mm. a sky, look like a skylight with a diffuser. Over it. And that, they're, they're really very clever. But the light tubes are very much more efficient. Yes, mm -hmm. but there's still, still a, there's still a penetration. But they have that you see on the bottom and the top. It's a beauty of the mm -hmm. Yeah, so but you'd be surprised how much heat is carried, mm -hmm. notwithstanding. And they get an awful lot of light. I mean, you can take the light around corners. Yes, think, so you can. So, so well, you can take the light around corners with, with the, with the um, panel and light. So, yeah. you can actually, you can and you can have it on a bitch <laughs> if you need it. Yeah. So. I they're, like quite, that idea. they're quite versatile, yes. and it you know, does it during the day when you when you want it. And, and, you, and you can put the night. panel in a place that gets sure. the most light. Mm. You're not restricted by the light. geometry so much. Yeah. 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 So the, mm -hmm. the same LEDs. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, these are things that we have around all day long, much more than your normal. Yeah. Don't start me on engineering on LED lighting. We do it at work, and you get so many problems. Yeah. Anyway, I've, I've seen I've seen a couple of places with these types of systems installed, and, and they look very effective. Um, well, a lot of heating these days is six being zoned. That's that's very efficient, but no one seems to insulate the internal walls. Yeah, so there must be a lot of transfer internally and through between floors as well. Mm -hmm. Is that you seen that happen? Yeah, it's a trade-off there. Yeah. Um, if you insulated the internal walls uh, and and you heated selectively, then the rest of the house is going to be 
It's so cold. Yeah, but if you're not so, using one area, you're only off one area. Yeah. It's more than that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, again, it's a trade-off. People uh, like the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you might want to in, insulate some internal walls. Uh, yeah. That also gives you some acoustic benefits. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a trade-off. Yeah. 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 I'd like to come back to the air cell insulation because the reason I had some air cell to play with on the <coughs> truck door is that when the house was built, we had air cell put under the colour bond roof. And the benefit from that is absolutely astounding. Compared to our neighbour who has the, the normal just condensation film under the colour bond roof, I can go up in the, in the roof space any time of year, no matter how sunny it is, and I don't die of heat exhaustion. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, won't, he won't even go up in his roof space but it's hot when the sun is shining because it's so damn yeah. hot. Yeah. I've got um, air cell under my roof, under my corrugated yeah. iron as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, so. it takes all the stress off the ceiling insulation. Yeah. So. You can't not have the ceiling insulation, you've still got to have that. Yeah. But the benefit is. <laughs> yeah. I'd support that. So what's the cost of air cell? Um, Expensive and then double it. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's good. It comes in rolls about what, 160 mil wide and about 20 metres long. Um, and they're a couple hundred bucks a roll. So it's not cheap. But the incremental cost when you're building your house is not. Yeah. I think they So it's more expensive per square metre than, than cheap insulation. It's a lot less expensive per square metre than, say, patient material. So there's a, there's a scale of expense in, in technologies that give you insulation. And you don't get worried about the electric hazards? We shouldn't have any open electrics up there. <laughs> well, if, if you've got the electrics in the colour on roof, you've got a problem. Yeah. So they're, they're post the home insulation scheme where a couple of mm. people were killed punching holes through um, uh, foil insulation uh, and foil insulation uh, yeah there are some regulatory problems and some image problems associated with that, that, that class of technology but if you're careful um, then you just got to be very careful, and um, there are some situations where it's not recommended. Uh, so you'd have to consult your insulation expert. Yeah, it's still available. Because with some solar, am I right in thinking sometimes with solar panels there are lights coming down into the yeah. roof yeah. area? Yeah. So the, the risk we're talking about is just if you punch a staple through the wire, and, and that's that's only a risk getting us all times. And you just look first. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? You go look first. You look yeah. you, you know, you don't go about looking for wires to staple yeah. into, but well, it, I can say from first hand experience that it is it can be difficult. I've seen some houses are pretty wide, pretty horrible yeah. in the roof. So <laughs> it's you can get plastic staples. People who do the professional with this, this oh. stuff use non conductive staples. That gets around that problem. Yes. To, to it basically, mainly. Well, completely. I mean, oh, I punching a, a piece of plastic into the wire is not going to electrocute you. And punching an electric, uh, a, a wire staple certainly will. Uh, any more questions? Just one quick one. Back to the downlights. Do LED downlights, do they have the insulation? Can, ins can downlights have insulation over the top? A as I was saying before, um, it depends on the rating of the light. Uh, this is a new standard called I IC rating, insulation contact. If it's, if it's appropriately rated light to be IC rated to be covered, so uh, then you can. Yeah, so you, um, know, you haven't got a blank thing saying LEDs are okay. No. no. Oh, the main thing is uh, that if you have an existing downlight fitting that can take a, a, a bulb that might either be LED or, or not, it, 
what you really, really shouldn't do is um, insulate over it. If someone can come back and change that light, change the bulb with a, with a, a halogen, that's, that's the risk that you're guarding against. So even if you have an LED light there, then the standards around clearance to insulation still apply because someone might come and refit a halogen bulb. No, I was talking about a new house where you're installing LED down in a, in a new build situation, yeah, you'd get good quality ones or use surface mount lights and not have any penetration at all. The reason why you're not allowed to insulate over them, is that because of fire or yes. is it because the LED will fail? Heat. Fire. Mm. It's a thermal. It's still a thermal risk of fire. Yeah. But 10 mass heat canes are supposed to get none of that problem, aren't they? I'm yeah. hoping they do. Yeah. They, my boss has explained to me that the, the regulations have changed a little. So things that were installed and legal at the time that they were done are still legal. But the standards have tightened a bit to, so that stuff done today makes it harder to use downlight covers. So instead of covering the light, you're better off just replacing it with a sealed unit. So we used to, in fact, even in this book, when this book was written, um, I was of the view that covering the lights was okay. With, you know, with, with a suitable purpose-built downlight cover, I no longer hold that view because you can get cheap and safe sealed units that aren't expensive and you're better off just replacing the what entire thing. sealed units? Well, they, don't, they don't have a draft. They don't, some of these downlights have a lot. They have a hole go right through the roof. Sealed in the sense that there's no replaceable bowl mm -hmm. and there's no par air pathway through it. So when you fit it in the ceiling, um, there's no bowl to replace and there's no air pathway to the in, in the unit. Oh, so like those like gimbal ones Yeah, these gimbal downlights here ah. um, allow an air to pass through it, so they're not sealed. Oh, they're, they're not Yeah, so, so they're examples of fittings. Yeah, yeah, that takes a, an MR16 um, halogen light. And some often you see those bulbs replaced with LED bulbs. But um, you've still got the other two problems. You've still got the, the Swiss cheese effect on the insulation and you've still got uh, uh, the dry problem. So I think we're probably... Um, one more question? The very last question. Yes. Early in the show... Sorry? Early in the show you mentioned just the electricity meter yeah. having a Zigbee facility. Yes. Zigbee, it's not an acronym. I don't know where the name comes from. Uh, Z-I-G-B-Y. It's, it's a... Double it, It's a wireless standard that works at, uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz band, so it's uh, in the same frequency band as your wireless, uh, Wi-Fi, as your cordless phones. And that's, that's just to get data. To, to yeah. get data into your house to work out. It, 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 it's a standard that lets devices talk to smart meters. Mm -hmm. uh, Listen to it. It can interrogate, it can ask the smart meter what, yeah. what things are. Tell it anything. Sorry. It can. They can tell it. There, there, there are certain classes of device. It can tell it. Like, them like, um, this. <laughs> Where, where the smart meter can actually control yes. the device, like turning off a pool pump or something yes. like that. And so conceivably, you can have situations where through the grid, mm -hmm. uh, you can have devices turned off yeah. in individual homes. Mm -hmm. And the other thing Zigbee can do uh, on in-home displays is pass messages. So in-home displays can have a messaging facility. So they might say, you might have the, the grid provider say, oh, we're at a peak power situation um, please conserve energy. Or um, the, the standard actually also provides for passing tariff information dynamically. Um, the Victorian industry has been very nervous about using that, but the technology provides for it even though it does not use it yet. So you could have dynamic pricing. It provides for <coughs> dynamic price information going to homes. Well, that's, thank you, Richard. Yes. A number of questions.